So to resume, I'll first illustrate these uh, uh, instabilities in a simple robot to connect to what I said yesterday. So to put that on a robot, uh, we essentially need to link a field to sensory inputs, right? And on this robot, that's the one we saw yesterday in this movie, uh, the relative sensors now are five microphones, these little very cheap microphones, a little bit uh, directionally selective, so we're considering to be sampling heading direction. Every microphone looks at a particular part of heading direction. Heading direction is in the world, right? So now for the first time we actually need to calibrate it, that is when we know in which direction, we, you know, we know how the microphone is mounted on the robot, but to know in which direction it is probing, we need to know where the robot is oriented. So now we need to have an estimation of the uh, robot's heading that might degrade over time um, in order to assign the contribution of any uh, microphone to a particular heading direction. This is actually already a topic about coordinate uh, transformation can think of the microphone being sort of like a retinal space and you have to transform it into an allocentric space to actually be meaningful. And Sebastian tomorrow morning will show you how that really works here. It's just done by knowing the formula, which is of course not a neural uh, method. So every microphone contributes a, a whole uh, Gaussian that's our approximation of the sensor characteristic. The micro, you know, these cheap microphones are not actually, they don't have a very reproducible cone, but uh, it's approximated by that Gaussian function, and it, uh, that activates a neural field defined over heading direction in a region that reflects its cone of sensitivity, about plus minus 30 degrees. So really you have only five numbers, namely the intensity levels picked up by these microphones. That's our sensor information, five numbers. And what we want to do is represent sound sources in the environment. So we want to uh, estimate the direction from which the sound comes. And so the field is you know, the kind of field we're looking at right now, heading direction, builds peaks based on these kind of inputs. For instance, if you have two uh, sources, then the five um, numbers might look like that. The microphones that are closer to where the sources are are more activated, so their contribution will be a stronger input to the field. And here's uh, the instabilities on that robot. This is from actual data on that robot. We put that robot, um, uh, we fixed it, we disconnected from the motors, uh, just played uh, to its uh, microphones, uh, a loudspeaker where we played some music. And uh, in this case, the, uh, this was the location of the loudspeaker and we just uh, increased manually. Estelle Bichel did this in Marseille. It's all uh, very simple kind of experiments with minimal equipment. So you just turn the knob of the loudspeaker up and therefore the volume increases. You see some fluctuations here as the music plays. And as you see here, the, the field goes through the detection instability, forms a peak, and then you can sort of see with the naked eye how the peak is a little bit more stable than the input. And so that would be the decision. There is something. In the movie, you'll see that that happens twice. It happens when the uh, robot picks up the echo of the sound source from the wall and then it goes there for a while and then it actually switches to the correct one. Here is how selection does and that's what the robot does, it selects between two sources. We put two loudspeakers here and then the field actually selected one of the two and then stabilizes that selection decision. You see sometimes there's more activity on the left but it stays with that, right? That will be the selection feature. Um, selection actually also does robust estimation which is something um, engineers like very much. He, in this case, we just had a, uh, a sound source, a loudspeaker, and next to the sound was, source, we put some uh, cardboard carton that uh, reflected more sound, so we get a tail here of sound, and uh, the peak is lo localized over the local maximum, uh, and that suppresses here this side. This is a form of selection, right? And so generally, robust estimation is this capacity to suppress outlying uh, samples and that is an uh, automatic feature of uh, uh, dynamical fields. And, and that already connects to this topic that I hinted at, you know, how do we relate to probabilistic appro approaches. I don't have a lecture about that. Anyone interested, I'm happy to discuss that. It's sort of an ongoing topic of discussion among us. Uh, finally, of course, uh, uh, it's an attractor and therefore it is able to track time varying sensor information. So when we move the loudspeaker across the auditory array here of the vehicle, the peak moves along, the peak is a little bit delayed, it doesn't make any particular kind of prediction, it just moves along. 
As a curiosity, I tell you that um, we did a similar experiment in uh, neurophysiology, uh, visual space. We moved something across the retina and observed in uh, area 17, you know, the vi primary visual cortex of the cat, uh, population responses to uh, retinal location. And we found uh, sort of exactly that. And in fact, we found that there is some aspect of prediction. Um, that shows up as the latency being reduced uh, when you track a stimulus compared to when you first present a stimulus. In the anesthetized cat, so no attention, you know, no, no high level perception. And uh, this is a generic property of dynamical fields in the neurophysiologically more realistic scenario that we're using in some of our models. Uh, you, you might have a chance to use uh, these models. These are called two layer models when we uh, actually have a separate layer for doing the inhibition. I just mentioned that because you will run into that problem. Um, you know, in, in, in the kernel has positive and negative parts. It looks like a field location can do excite the neighbors and inhibit further uh, away. That is actually neurophysiologically unrealistic. Neurons have only one kind of synapse. Sometimes it's called Dale's principle by theoreticians, but experimentalists just find that obvious. So they're, they're only they're either excitatory or inhibitory, so they can't mix like that. Uh, what you actually have is so-called inhibitory interneurons, that is, the uh, neurons we're looking at are all excitatory because that's the path through which you can project onto downstream structures. And uh, they can excite their neighbors, and then they excite inhibitory neurons. This is like a second layer of a field. And these inhibitory neurons then inhibit. And so it's a two-stage process. And what happens is that uh, if you have a peak of activation, the local excitation makes a prediction, namely that the next stimulus is going to be near, left or right, and it's going to be around the current peak. And, um, and the inhibitory layer reflects the past. Because of this two-stage process, you will have an inhibitory uh, activation that lags a little bit behind the excitatory uh, activation. And that makes a difference between the front and the back end of the peak. The front is fresh, there's no inhibition there. The back end has some inhibition, and therefore you have some form of uh, prediction. That's sort of a genetic feature. There's a psychophysical paradigm, the so-called uh, line motion illusion that is used as a probe of that, and my colleague Dirk Janke uh, works on that. So there's a place here for prediction. This, this is not, uh, not that. Finally, working memory here, we uh, turn the loudspeaker on and off in a short interval. We induce a peak, and this is actually the memory here behind the peak. Uh, you see, we actually, it's very sh short-lived because in this robotic demonstration, we actually actively destroy memory after a while. Whenever we detected that there was a peak without input, we weakened the resting level. Um, because we, uh, you know, with a vehicle, if you drive around, the uh, direction which a target lies becomes irrelevant after a while because you're, you're moving in the world and the direction to the target changes. So we wanted to get rid of that just as a, as a feature. Uh, of course, in, in uh, human uh, work memory, that is not true. We, we, we don't have spontaneous decay. And this is the video I showed. Uh, I think I have to click here. I showed before. Remember, I, we have here the sound coming out of this room you will see that it uh, built a peak here, right now, to the echo. We were able to track this on the screen, but it's hard to see in the video. And now, I think, now it's losing that peak and it will be locking onto the peak that comes out of that room. And, you know, we'll ultimately go there. It's a bit boring. So it, it does detection, make the peak selection, echo versus real source. Uh, it doesn't. Act, it has a little bit of memory, work memory. The mu music is intermittent. It can do a little bit of uh, working memory here to bridge these gaps. This robot was developed by Estela Bisu, from who is now in, in Portugal. Who um, it was meant to respond to human voices, not the content, just the sound. And it did that, and, and the music was just to make it easier for us. It also does obstacle avoidance and, and things like that. So I'll accelerate that a little bit, and it ends up in front of the loudspeaker. Um, and I, I didn't tell you how the field and the attractor dynamics couple. And my goal is, if, I, if I'm totally efficient, at the end of this little uh, session to show you that. There's one more trick uh, hidden there. Oops, sorry. I wanted to move on.
So that's just to, to remind you of these instabilities. I have to do one more uh, theoretical thing, uh, introduce one more theoretical concept to then show you the A and B example, and that's the memory trace. So it's the question of how can we build these small inhomogeneities in the fields that I showed you then can be amplified into peaks. Um, of course, there are all the learning rules that you know about. Uh, most of those are based on Hebbian kind of thinking. Hebbian thinking is correlative, that something, the learning process depends on, on the conditions in two neurons. And if these match in some sense, then the connection between them is strengthened. And in some other con cases, is, it's weakened when, when there is some anti-correlation. Um, that is sort of second order. There's actually a first order learning that has been used in neural networks under the label of bias terms and is not very significant in neural networks exactly because they don't deal with instabilities. But because of the detection instability, the first order uh, process that would only depend on one thing, on one activation level, not on two, actually uh, already has enormous functional impact and therefore we very often use that. Here's the idea, you have a peak somewhere and you lay down a memory trace, uh, in, for instance in a second field, so this peak drives this up, the, the time scale is slower by definition, it's learning, it takes a little longer, you have to have multiple experiences to drive the learning. And then conversely, once you have this uh, activation here, you uh, put uh, this excitatory input to this, this field, this weak excitatory input. You see here that uh, previously there was some memory trace that decays under the influence of, of uh, this uh, new memory trace being built, that is a memory like that is subject to interference. Uh, whenever uh, memory is built somewhere, everywhere else memory decays. We're, not assuming, we're assuming that memory does not decay spontaneously. That is, if there's no input to the memory, then it just, just stays put. There's an equation for that, but I, I'll just tell you that outcome. That's a good description of what empirically happens. That is, uh, the kinds of memories that we'll be modeling don't decay spontaneously, but they decay uh, due to interference. Um, now, mathematically, we're writing this as a second activation field that has a slower time scale. Um, this here is the second field that has a slower time scale. Um, but that is um, sort of an ad hoc model. Nearly, this is more likely to be an actual chemical process, uh, synaptic in nature or uh, uh, you know, in involving some special biophysical mechanisms. And you could think of those as being synaptic, the, the, the ways these th things are uh, built. So uh, this is just a functional description of that. Important, this is a slower time scale than that. Typically slower maybe by a factor of 10. Not dramatically slow, that is in a single trial you can uh, build uh, some form of memory. And then this uh, memory field uh, excites uh, the original field that it's driven from. Uh, in this particular formulation, this is a number that's always positive, so don't, we don't need a sigmoid here. There are different formulations that we've used. Um, and we sometimes use a kernel here just to sort of like a smoothing. It's just a forward kernel. So again, the details don't matter. If you have that picture here, um, that's enough. In the, in the equation, uh, the uh, models code that you will be using, there is um, a template for that. And that template is more sophisticated than that because it has different rates for the growth and the decay of these memories. There's decay through interference. And there's some empirical evidence that the decay is slower than the growth. And there's a simple mathematical way of expressing that. Uh, so what will happen if you have something like that is that the memory trace reflects the statistics of uh, activation, of what happened in that field. It doesn't reflect the statistics of input. It reflects the statistics of the decisions made by the field. Right? So for instance, if you induce a single peak, then there will be activation at that field. It looks linear just because it's a very slow time scale compared to this one. And then uh, you know, here you see the pre-activation, and you put another peak here, and then it will be uh, you will then uh, develop a peak landscape. So for instance, if you always have one location, your memory trace will, this is the memory trace, will uh, you know, be monomodal. If you have two peaks, it uh, will be a bimodal distribution of that. Many years ago with Wolfram Erlhagen, Hagen, I showed that a model like that can learn the probabilities of certain outcomes. So for instance, we showed that probabilistic effect and response time emerge from a memory trace like that. And again, you can ask what's the connection to probabilistic thinking and there are some subtleties about that, about normalization and so on that one can discuss.
In our robotic work, we haven't used that very much. We're, we're using it now for object learning, and there are still open issues about that. Uh, we're also using Hebbian learning, um, and uh, Matis will briefly refer to that. Um, I think we will have to use it more in the future, but uh, currently we don't use it very much. But I need this for this one example, the A0P paradigm. So this is an example in the, you know, in the psychology, uh, but we actually built a robot model of it as well. And you will see it actually does, does provide some insight. Um, most of you will not know that, right? I, I guess psychologists might know it. Anyone else knows this? Yeah, a few people know it. I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, telling you about the background. Um, it's an experiment that goes back to Piaget uh, about the sensory motor basis of cognition. It was thought to be uh, the, the onset of cognition when uh, infants start to be able to keep something in mind that's out of sight. It's not actually a precise description because infants do reach for hidden objects. So out of sight is not out of mind even at that age. You will see it's more subtle what, what, what is out of sight here. In the original version, this is the infant seen from the top. Um, this is a box with two troughs and they're lids, for instance, that how you can cover them. And in the classical version, you hide a toy uh, under one lid, you know, making sure the infant watches. And then you induce a delay of, let's say, up to 10 seconds and uh, push the box to the t in the reaching space and the infant will, will be quite willingly reach for the lid, maybe get the lid, put, put the lid in, into the mouth or get the toy, put the toy in the mouth. These are infants who are six, seven, eight, nine months. Uh, at about 12 months of age, reliably infants stop making this, this error that I'll describe now. This is the A trial. You do this a couple of times, for instance, four or five times. And then you have a B trial where you hide the toy under the B lid, you wait these 10 seconds, and then the A not B error consists of the infant reaching for the A lid rather than the B lid, not getting the toy. That's the classical story. Out of sight, out of mind was supposed to be like that. Of course, they do reach for the hidden toy, so it's relative. Turns out the toy is probably not um, really critical, although there's some debate about that. Uh, there's a toyless version of it where you just have the lids. And so the lids are always visible, right? They're always there. But you attract the attention to a lid, and for instance, uh, schematized like this, uh, attract the attention to the lid, get the infant to reach for the lid a couple of times, then you attract attention to the other lid, you, know, you wave the lid, hit it on the box, look, look, that's look. They willingly follow these social cues and then still they reach for the wrong lid. So in that sense, this is more a probe of a sensory motor decision making, which of two lids they take, both are visible, not so much really about a hidden object primarily, and then what they have is a, a tendency to perseverate, that is they go for um, the lid that they have a habit of going to more than following the cue, following the current um, attentional cue to a new lid. Perseveration. Perseveration is a very general phenomenon. You see this in these, it stops about a one year of age, but there are other conditions under which you can make two or three or four year olds perseverate. For instance, if you don't have lids, hide the toy in sand, no, 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 no perceptual marker, then you will perseverate later. Uh, school children perseverate when uh, you give them cognitive tasks, for instance, uh, a table of multiplications, and then you do divisions, and they will. Uh, possibly uh, s stick to multiplication and not switch. Uh, you know, mature scientists have perseveration, like I still talk about dynamical systems after 30 years, just get, getting stuck in something. Um, how would we deal with that in terms of our neural fields? Well, after the stories I've been telling, it might be very natural to think of the, the field that drives this uh, being a motor field, that is the reaching direction toward one of those two locations being represented by this population of neurons, who knows exactly where, perhaps motor, parietal or somewhere, and uh, a peak forming over the A location would be predictive of reaching to A, a peak over the B location reaching to B. There's actually evidence that it is in some sense motor. For instance, you can uh, make a difference, a motoric difference between the A and B trial by putting a a weight onto the arm of the baby with a Velcro, you know, like just a few hundred grams, not something major, and that destroys perseveration. So if they reach with the weight and then you take the weight off, then they're fine on B. So it looks like it's the movement parameters that are being encoded. And there are different things, like you can have the, the kid 
uh, stand up on the B trial, so while they sit on the A trial or vice versa and they also don't perseverate. Very, very fancy, you do the B trial twice and then first B trial they stand up, no perseveration, then you set them down again, they perseverate. Uh, so it's uh, quite fancy. Um, this is, um, so it's likely uh, that it is in some sense motor. Now if you think of this uh, field then you, you want to consider the different kinds of inputs. There is the input, we call that specific input, that would be that window in time when you're attracting attention to one of the lids. Uh, that would have an, uh, you know, a peak at A or at B, depending on the trial. We would be assuming that there is a, what we call a pre-shaping input, the memory trace making input, that pre-shapes the field and sends it's present before you wave the lid. It's there all the time. And then there is the often overlooked, uh, what we call task input, that is the fact that there is this perceptual layout. There are these lids that you see. So at both A and B there is some input. Uh, in the sandbox, for instance, that's what you don't have. You don't have these discrete locations. There's also, we ourselves overlook the fact that there's a difference between the box being in reaching space or outside reaching space. And so now we're uh, saying when the box is in the reaching space, there is some broad input over the box that wasn't there before and that pushes the, the field through the detection instability in any case. So roughly the story is this, that uh, these instabilities show up in different phases of the movement. When you, you know, present them with a uh, specific cue, you get a, a detection stability where you uh, induce a peak. Selection is that you're making that decision, either a peak over A or over B. Um, and I'll show you these other two in a moment. So here's the, uh, oh, yeah. Here is the uh, account for, sorry, I, I uh, seem to have the short version here. Let me then step through that. So this will be on an A trial. You're waving this on an A and uh, the peak forms at the A location and uh, lays down a memory trace and there are some differences in the model when that exactly happens. But it happens certainly when the reach is initiated. Uh, a memory trace at the A location. And so when you do it again, there is already that memory trace makes it easier and easier to induce the peak at A. And then um, when you, uh, after the delay, uh, no, so during the delay, the, um, the peak will decay for the young infant because the young infant is supposed to uh, have weak interaction and not in the interaction regime. That's how we model the young infant. And, um, and therefore, after the delay, it will have this kind of uh, pattern of activation. And what happens is that the, the boost of the box being pushed through uh, into the reaching space uh, induces a, a boost-driven detection instability and brings up the peak here in this case at the A location because there's more activity at A than at B. There is a memory chase at A and there is perhaps some uh, of this activation from the stimulus. Uh, we actually found uh, some subtleties, I'll be happy to talk about that but not now, that um, there, there are procedures experimentalists use, so-called training trials, that might be largely responsible for inducing the bias to A. It's not even always clear that they really pay attention to the Q at all. Uh, older infants, in contrast, are assumed to be on the other side of the memory instability. They are assumed to sustain, be able to sustain peaks of activation in the absence of localized input. And therefore, oops, sorry. For older infants, the story would be that on a B trial, oh, I didn't even say what happens on a B trial, sorry. So young, back to young infants. On a B trial, you induce uh, the peak at B, but the, uh, in the delay, the peak decays, and after the delay, there will be more activation at A than at B from the memory trace, and therefore, when the boost comes, they still build the peak at A. That's the A, not B arrow. Yeah. So they ignore the Q. While older infants are supposed to be above the memory instability, so when the uh, stimulus comes at B, they are able to sustain that peak, so when the boost comes, they, they, this just strengthens the peak at the B location and they respond correctly. That's the story. So that entails all these different instabilities. Now this assumption that young infants are uh, below and older infants are above the memory instability, that is uh, you know, the one sort of descriptive feature of this account. In the meantime, there's a whole literature on that kind of assumption. We've called this the spatial position hypothesis for other reasons, and signatures of that kind of hypothesis show up in a lot of different experiments. So, and since we've been able to show with older infants and, and toddlers that uh, 
the, this signature shows up in their magic precision of memory. Um, so we can actually more precisely say what change in the interaction occurs. It's a change in which there is more localized excitatory interaction and um, also uh, more localized, also stronger inhibitor interaction over, over uh, time. So the overall interaction is strengthened and it is strengthened also in the sense of sharpened. Um, uh, and, and we can see different signatures of that. That overall makes self-excited peaks more likely, but it also makes them more precise. And, and from different fields, we have convergent evidence for that. Um, here's an example of, of a simulation that shows the, the whole time course of something like that. So here are all the different, this time, all the different trials. In every case, here's the specific stimulus. So, so waving the lid at, at the A location, uh, the delay and then the, the ridge is the boost where you give the field the entire you know, uh, um, activation and you see a peak is formed so the field responds at A here and that forms a memory trace. This is the memory trace uh, field. Uh, a little activation uh, is induced by that uh, event. And then on the you know, reset, this is the one thing that's not so clear what happens when you take the lid from the baby. They don't like that very much. And you restart the trial, so in the field we just reset the field to the resting level, and then you know adduce uh, stimulus, you know response, and so on. And at some point we have uh, the B trial here, the input at B boost, and then the response occurs at A due to the memory trace. Memory trace biases the selection at boost to to uh, B, and therefore you make the this is the A not B error repeated twice. Now well, that's the account we did quantitative accounts and so on, um, and that's the memory trace. And um, yeah, a prediction of this, you know, the interesting thing here is that the decision is made by the field. It's made by interaction inside the field. And this is a little bit different from um, a lot of connections models. There's actually a competing connections model that is sh shares a lot of ideas with ours uh, by Munakata and McLennan. Um, in, in those uh, models, typically, the decision is made on readout. You have the field and then you have some other process looks at, looks at the maximum. For instance, Munakata just assumed that the probability of choosing A over B is a function of how much activation there is at B versus how much at A, that you have some mechanism of doing that. And what, uh, that's important because the consequences of that decision are not visible in the representations downstream, somehow outside. But uh, here it's made in the field and that has consequences. And here's an example of that. Here is a so-called spontaneous error that is on a, a trial. It was stimulus at A, the field generates a peak at the B location. Uh, in the model, this is just through fluctuations. So the boost brings up the peak from uh, this low level input and sometimes through a fluctuation it can occur at the wrong location. Um, this happens in uh, experiment. About 20% of the infants make these errors. Typically, you use the infant only once. You do one experiment, one A not B sequence like that. Exactly because of such things, history effects. And 20% of the infants um, make these kind of errors. In many experiments, these infants are excluded from the analysis. Uh, in the data that we had with Esther Thielen and Linda Smith in her lab, we actually included them in the analysis and looked at what happens. And one thing that happens is that when infants make the spontaneous error on an A trial, they tend to make it multiple times. And that's what the model does here. On the second uh, A6 on this trial, we see another spontaneous error. Um, that is uh, promoted by the fact that the memory trace was built now at B. So that promotes reading reaching to B. The other thing that infants do is when they do the spontaneous error, they don't make the A not B error. And you see that here. Now we get the input at B. Oops, my battery here is uh, falling. At B, and then it reaches correct to B, again, based on the memory trace uh, building at B. So the uh, spontaneous error induces um, correct reaching. It's of course for different reasons, not like they follow the cue. They just have a new habit they form to go to, to B. Um, we, uh, here's uh, some quantitative data to show that we can account for that. And uh, this is mm, uh, sort of sophisticated da data analysis you can make of um, a large ensemble of such uh, experiments. We had 400 babies, uh, meta-analysis in different conditions, but we threw them together in a certain way. 
And uh, <clears throat> uh, what you see is the conditional probability if you went to B on an A trial uh, f on, uh, first on one uh, particular uh, moment in the A trial, what's the probability to go there again on the next trial? Um, and you see uh, two lines, you see the blue is the infant data and the uh, uh, C on line is the model. Uh, what's significant about that is that the average, uh, the spontaneous error rate is about 20% in this ensemble and the conditional probability is uh, more like 40%. That is the probability of making the spontaneous error again is larger than the prior probability of making the uh, spontaneous error. And that shows that you know, it promotes making the error and that's correctly predicted by the model. The red line is a a way to exclude um, another kind of account. You could think that the spontaneous errors are just babies who have a side bias, who, who always just want to go to that side. In the model you can compute what the probability would be and then you get a line that's clearly not right. So side bias doesn't account for this result. Last point I want to make uh, is now um, uh, bring that on a robot. So we, d we did a robot model of, uh, of this uh, you know, this, mo this model is published and we did a lot of uh, parametric things and account for a lot of data. Um, and then Esther Thielen actually at that time wanted us to use our robots, she became aware of, of my robotic line, to, uh, make, to make this model uh, on, on, on the robot as, an, as a pedagogical thing and, and to learn about it. And I even was kind of hesitant, you know, I know robots are always difficult and a lot of stuff doesn't work. But we did it. We brought that robot to uh, Indiana and built, had to rebuild it, had broken on, on transport and we did these experiments and we, f we discovered an error in our thinking. We had not really, uh, we had done readout. We had looked at where the peak is, maximum is and that um, was not a peak always and that made that sometimes the robot would randomly uh, wander because the maximum would jump around. We, we have said we need peaks, uh, stable states and we forgot about it ourselves. Uh, and that led us to understand that we need this boost. And we fixed that problem, took, took actually a long time. And then, um, I'm, I'm, uh, and actually the paper is still published, I'm, I'm, it's my fault, it's sitting on my desk for years now. Um, it's, I, I mention it now because it's illustri it shows insights that we can gain uh, from these kind of robots. Uh, so the, the robot is not a robot arm. Uh, we have a, uh, just a vehicle that just makes an orientation, orienting response. It's a, one of these vehicles, you'll see it in a moment. It's actually, in the, this experiment's a Capra. Originally it was this Marseille robot. And it, uh, in the version I'll show you, it uses vision. And uh, we present it with cue cards, and we give a cue by just pushing it close to the robot, and then uh, we impose a delay, and then we push both cues close to the robot, and that should uh, push the system through the detection stability. When there's a peak, the robot will turn. Now, I'll use this to tell you how that link to the heading direction dynamics actually occurs. Um, so nothing special about these cues. We just uh, have a color filter and only these colored pixels contribute and we sum vertically. We just need the horizontal. And so the bigger the cue is, the more vertical stuff we sum and the bigger the input. That's, that's all we have there. And there are two resolutions. I will skip over that. We do this coordinate transform from retinal to world just algorithmically, keeping track of where the robot looks, no problem. Now here's the critical thing. Now we have a peak in this field of a heading direction and we want to make an attractor at the peak location. Right? That is sort of the transition between neural dynamics and behavioral dynamics. And uh, this is actually connected to a well-known uh, issue, it's sometimes called the space code to rate code transition. Uh, you know, the peaks have this property, uh, sort of space code, they have this property that w you know, the, all the neurons vote for their value and they kind of zero vote, right? If there's no peak, then there's no vote. That's space code. Uh, while rate code means uh, any value of the neuron um, has meaning. So when you have little firing, it means a small value for whatever you encode. Right? When you have a high value, it's, you know, encode something different. Remember these uh, Breitenberg tuning curves, that's rate code. Any value of activation has a meaning. Uh, 
And uh, in a sense, this is sort of rate code that is any location. If this is a urine that encodes heading direction, then different firing levels reflect uh, different values. So uh, that there's some transition there. And the, it's a famous problem that is if there's no peak here, what do we do with the rate code? You know, a, a rate code neuron has, can never be neutral. It always expresses something. Like if a, a sensory neuron in the retina doesn't fire, then it means no light. Actually, it's the other way around in the retina. But you know, in other uh, parts, uh, they always express an opinion. They can never say, I, I don't know. And, uh, and that's a problem you have to face in there. It's connected to a normalization problem. So the way people might typically think of that is that I want to compute the peak position and the typical way people think about it is it's like taking a theoretical mean that is considered this a probability distribution typically just the sigmoid right you take the sigmoid activity this battery is fading here sigmoid activity and consider that a probability distribution and then you would compute its mean by computing something like that you, s you recognize that if this was a probability density, then this would be the mean, you know, x prime times x prime times the probability of x prime. That's the theoretical mean, not the arithmetic, the theoretical. If you know the distribution, it only works if the uh, if you normalize, right? The probability distributions usually are normalized. If you don't normalize, uh, like the uh, if you don't divide by this, and the peak is very large, this gives you a large number. So it's shifted to the right. It's larger than it should be. If the peak is very small and you don't normalize, it gives you a small number, and then it's biased, right? The only way this is not biased is if it's normalized. So it's not a technicality. It's really critical. That makes a problem if you have a zero, zero peak, right? If there's no supra threshold activity, you divide by zero. So this is, this is wrong. And um, there, in the literature, there are proposals for how there could be normalizing circuits and doing special things. And maybe that exists somewhere. But what an insight that we had from this line of work is that we don't need that. We don't need to read this out. Because what we want is just an attractor. We want an attractor at this peak. When there's a peak, and if there's no peak, we just want it to be flat. So the, the, the slope of the uh, dynamics, the strength of the attractor, is a function of the peak strength. And so what we can do is this. This looks complicated. I'll take you through it. It's actually trivial. Here's this formula for the theoretical peak. A dynamics that has an attractor at that uh, location would be x dot, I took x, it should be heading direction, right? So x is heading direction, sorry, changing letter here. x minus x peak with a minus sign, that will be a negative uh, straight line that has the, the uh, zero crossing at x equals x peak, right? That will be the right dynamics. Now, I've written in front of it the normalization factor. I could write another multiplicative factor, but now I just took the normalization factor because I want that uh, negative uh, line to be flat when there's no peak. So if I multiply the x minus x prime uh, with this, it, I will make sure that when there's a peak, I have you know, a negative straight line with a zero crossing at x peak. And when there is no peak, then I multiply over zero, I have this. Right? That's this line here. Does everyone see that? And now you just uh, plug in this formula here for x peak and um, realize that there is some, I put that in here, and then you realize that there is uh, a uh, cancellation. If I multiply this, then uh, you know, this cancels. This x peak has this in the denominator. It has the same thing here in the denominator, so it cancels. And I only get, I get this top part here on the right hand side. So I no longer divide by zero. Uh, here in fr front, I just kept this term. Then I can put them back into the, uh, you know, put this common factor out, and I get this here, which makes a lot of sense. Neurally, what this means is that every location x prime in the field votes not for its value. It votes for an attractor. x minus x, x prime is a straight line, zero crossing at x prime. It votes for an attractor with its current firing rate, you know, the more positive, the stronger that little attractor. That is really the uh, space code to rate code that we need. And so, so what you're reading out is dynamics. So it's not um, values. That's sort of a very general lecture.
In, in reality, uh, some of our models, and uh, actually other people have sort of used the same thing without making a theoretical analysis about it. You don't always put a linear function in here. You can put a little forcelet here that would have limited range. That works better. So you don't, you know, it's not literally that, <coughs> that derivation, but it's that kind of idea. Every location votes for a little <coughs> forcelet that is a little dynamics, and then you're superposing these different dynamics. And that is what is on that robot. Here's a simulation from that robot. The robot sees the scene, it has some filter, and the, uh, the filter amplifies just this color. And then you see um, uh, here a couple of different lines. I always get confused what is what. Uh, the, the blue must be really the, the peak that is ultimately formed um, in overheading direction, and uh, that made the robot turn to the right. So when this blue peak arises, becomes super threshold, the uh, attractor appears in heading direction. This heading direction makes this attractor here. And before that peak arose, this was flat. And I'll play that movie again to see that. So we have the input, this boosts one of those, and then when both are applied, this whole thing shifts up. It's enough to build a peak here, and that's when the attractor arises. Right, one more time. So this is now just all input driven, so, uh, you know, just by, by the actual camera input. There's no you know, inputs that we apply algorithmically. It's all just autonomous. And then you saw the little shift. That's when the robot actually turns. After the blue peak is formed, and when the attractor forms on bottom, you'll see a moment later the robot actually turns. Peak formed, and now rotation. Saw that? Yeah. So very simple. So here's the experiment. Evelina Dineva did this. Uh, she had music playing in the background because it was so boring. So she did actually the experiment with the robot, like you do with a baby. Um, making the experimental design, these are the two targets, and really applying this like an experiment, you know, the different stimuli, having the robot then respond to that, and then she registered which decision it made. Um, this is all, these are a couple of A trials, this is A, this is B. Um, there is some subtlety about that, you saw that these asymmetrical, this is the training regime, which we modeled here as well. This is one movie out of you know, hundreds of trials, because actually, uh, infants experiment typically have asymmetrical A trials. You, uh, the A lid is closer to the baby for the first up to four trials to train the infant. It turns out to be critical to get the effect. Um, I just wanted to you, you show you the B trial, which this is maybe a, the third A trial, I think. Always the, the robot always turned to the right. This is the key. this was a specific cue. This is the boost, and the robot turns to the right. Very boring experiment, you can see, right? <laughs> the difference is the baby you get uh, supplied usually. The robot you have to build yourself. So for a model, it's actually a double work. You have to tune the parameters of the model, and you have to tune the models of the experiment. Now, experimentalists also tune their parameters. It's called piloting. Here, B trial. And the boost, and it turns hopefully to the right. So that may be A not B error, right? Uh, here's a. I, I'll, I'll skip this. We we account for the basic data. The basic data, uh, most classical data, is that the A not B error occurs as a function of the delay. But the interesting thing is, you can uh, do a whole battery of quantitative analysis. There's always infant data from this metadata set, and then. Uh, data from the model, and then actually data from the ro robot. It was quite a heroic effort. There's one case where we're a little bit off, but overall you just see whatever you analyze, certain probabilities, it doesn't even ma matter exactly what, we can fit a human behavior with a robot model. You know, it's certainly a unique uh, instance. Yes? So these are different measures I, I didn't explain in detail. Uh, you can sort of analyze um, you know, different aspects of the statistics of the data, for instance, uh, 
uh, the, how many correct responses on B1, so that's not making the error, or this is the data I showed you before. Uh, these two lines in the robot is new. This is the probability of making the spontaneous error again after making it first. You can look at how uh, many switches f uh, uh, from A to B occur as a function of how um, no, the, the um, frequency with which switches like that occur and, and different sorts of things. Uh, we analyzed like 10 such measures that measure different aspects of the uh, correlations in the data. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, uh, what's, uh, what's your um, explanation about the robots? Um, like, what's your explanation about the second spontaneous errors? Uh, why, why it's wrong? Um, I don't remember that exactly. Uh, I've written that somewhere. I mean, it's quite hard to uh, tune you know, parameters for a robot like that because you have the model parameters, but there's a the question you know, of how big was the um, thing that we used for the specific queue or you know, how, how far did we move the objects, how, f how far does it move like that. These are things that you tune in an infinite experiment because you play with you know, how big the box supposed to be and uh, how much uh, time do you leave the infant to play with the, the toy and there's no subtle parameters like that that you tune in experiment and that you'd have to tune for a robot. So I presume that if we worked harder, we would be able to get rid of that thing. But this is like an experiment. You cannot, can't do this uh, you know, many times with different parameter sets. You'd have to, at some point, you have to commit to a parameter set and then do the experiment. It takes you know, a week to do the experiment. <coughs> so it's not about quantitative fitting. It's more about the overall features. The last point, and I took a lot of time from Matis, so we'll have to see how to solve this problem. Um, is you know, when you do a robot model like that, now you can actually ask new questions. We already discovered errors in our thinking just as a heuristic device. You know, it led the robot implementation led us to discover that. But we can actually also have some insight about what, um, what this means. You know, why do infants make this stupid error? You could wonder, um, you know, why do they build a memory trace if the memory trace only makes them make the wrong thing? You know, it sounds really bizarre. Um, here is a, uh, an implementation of the young robot, and we added obstacle avoidance in the usual way, um, just to create a, a natural situation. You know, we can take the robot out of the lab now, right? Have it behave freely, just like infants do that. And so, with the uh, obstacles, we uh, make sure that it loses the target from side. There is a color target here to the left that's not visible in the video. That's where what the robot is going for. And by turning, it loses that from sight. And here, this young robot that has no memory loses the peak. And then it just goes straight. Flat dynamics goes straight. Right. While the old robot that has working memory um, has the peak, and that enables it to turn back. And of course, when it turns back, it, it sees again the target. And then it, it goes to the target. So that's the difference, right? But um, here is the. On the left, it's the same. Here on the right, we have the young robot, but with a memory trace. And what the memory trace enables the system is to turn back. The memory trace is actually something like a local resting level. It keeps the, um, it, 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 it makes it easier to reach the memory threshold, and it actually keeps that peak for a while. And that enables it to, to look back and uh, to go to the target, and th so that it shows what the memory trace does. It stabilizes behavior. It stabilizes that selection. It's actually a, a form of stabilizing um, uh, a representation, a motor plan, and, and it is a little. It's different from self, from a working memory in that it is less flexible. It is actually stabilizing it over this learning time of multiple uh, peaks. So what actually uh, and it actually makes a lot of sense if you, have, if you don't have very good calibrated uh, uh, representations. If you have only broad, um, not well calibrated calibration, it might be uh, useful to sample over larger time and to develop a good motor habit and then base your action more on the habit. And the price you pay is you're not as flexible. What ANOP actually probes is how quickly you can switch. And so young infants are not as able uh, to switch. Mo work memory is much more flexible. You can instantaneously switch to a new working memory. And that's what ANOP probes. It doesn't probe out of mind, out of sight. It probes how quickly you can uh, 
uh, switch to a, a new task, to new, new task decisions. I mean, it's not like this is a revolutionary new insight, but I think it's a, a good way to ground uh, a client like that. That's what the embodiment here does for you. Okay, um, I uh, conclude, and I don't think I have to take you through the whole story again. Um, uh, the, the, this core module this afternoon, you will have a chance to play with the simulator uh, to you know, make sure you understand how the peaks rise and disappear. We'll give you some suggestions on what you can do. Uh, you can also play with other simulators and then Sebastian will explain the architecture of those. I already answered a question about that. These simulators are all actually available. They're online. Now they're uh, freeware and, and there's instructions and so So you can go, for, uh, after this workshop, you will be able to do any of those things anytime. All of these simulators are available and are changeable by you and so on. That, that will be a way how you can really become familiar with all that.